Welcome to the American Customs Association. This is our main training facility. And first, let me thank you for choosing us as your educational provider. I'm going to be up at the podium, and you're going to be seated right here, the best seat in the house, front row and center. You're about to view a sample of our course material. And to keep it fair, you'll be able to preview about 10 different topics. Now keep in mind when you're watching that you'll be somewhat at a disadvantage because you've not had the benefit of the previous class. It's analogous to walking into any course which is halfway through. But because selecting the right program of study is such an important decision, we want you to witness firsthand our methodology and our approach to subject matter so you can make an informed decision. So have a look and I'll be back with some closing comments. To give you a preview of what we're going to talk about, and something comes in the United States and uh, what we have to do is and within 15 days from the day of import, the day it arrives, we have to come up with this. This document is called an entry. And then from the time we file the entry, within 10 working days, and please notice I said working, days are important, whether they're uh, calendar or working in how many days. Uh, they'll ask about that kind of stuff in the exam. We got to come up with this, this entry, uh, entry summary. It's a, it's a total different animal, a total different procedure, and an entry slash entry summary, uh, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But that's generally how everything is going to flow, and you probably got an idea of that after reading 141 and 142. When it comes to an entry, there are various entry types. There are types or categories, and for now, I just want you to be able to um, uh, understand like three of them that we're going to cover and we'll expand on this later. But when something comes in, uh, there are different entries predicated on what I'm going to do with that cargo. And uh, 141 and 142 both refer to something as a consumption entry. A consumption entry. And a consumption entry, about n over 99% uh, 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 of all your entries will be consumption entry. As the name implies, this product is being imported into the United States to be cons consumed into our economy. In other words, I'm going to buy it and, and I'm going to put it in my house. I'm going to buy it and I'm going to manufacture it. It, it, it. This product is going to enter um, our commerce in one way or another, and that's what just about all entries are. However, sometimes not all, not, not all product entering the United States will enter into our commerce. For example, uh, we also have something called warehouse entries, and we'll talk about warehouse entries later. Uh, a, a, an entry can be a warehouse entry, and basically, just to give you, uh, 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 give you a preview, here's the United States, and a guy imports something in, and he's not quite sure what to do with it yet. I don't know, maybe there was a, a, a company in China and they were going bankrupt and they were just unloading all their merchandise. So this guy brings it in and he's just going to store it. And, and I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. Some of this merchandise I might find a buyer for in Europe and I'm going to send it out. Some of this uh, later on I might bring into the United States and sell it to a guy in Denver or something. And then when I pull it out of the warehouse, then I'm going to have to do another entry, this consumption entry, because now this merchandise is entering into the commerce of the United States. But if I just bring it into a warehouse, it really isn't in the commerce of the United States, as long as it's in a bonded warehouse. A little bit more on that later. Uh, actually, a lot more on that later. But just know that that is an, a, a type of entry that I can do. Not everything is going to be consumed into the United States. And then the third entry, just to be aware, uh, aware of, we also have entries that are considered to be transportation entries. And a transportation entry, it, it really doesn't enter the commerce of the United States either. Um, a transportation entry can be used for a lot of things. For example, um, Let's say there's a boat, a product is leaving Europe, and it's destined for Japan. And rather than having that boat go all the way around Latin America or through the Panama Canal, the, the exporter could elect to say, I tell you what, let's take it to New York, and when it gets to New York, put it on a train or something or a truck through the United States, and then when it gets to uh, Seattle, then another boat will pick it up and take it into Japan. So as you can see, 
this, this product, this merchandise, is not really entering into the commerce of the United States, is it? It's, it's just passing through. And we have to somehow uh, accommodate uh, this movement within the United States. We can't just let anything go. We have to account for it somehow. And for that, we can do a transportation entry. And plus, we can do a bunch of other things with the transportation entry. But for now, uh, just be aware that we, when we talk about entries, that there are basically three types, consumption, warehouse, and transportation. As you know, today we're going to talk about Part 134 of the regulations, and we're going to talk about country of origin marking. And actually, we, we, after you've done your reading, you, know, you now know that it's a requirement that all articles imported into the customs territory be marked with the country of origin. And we mentioned that in our last class when we talked about examination. One of the reasons that we want to examine is to verify marking requirements. But actually, what's interesting is this law is in the customs regulations, but that's not where it originated from. The marking requirement complements uh, the use that customs has for it. But the law originally came from another law that, that states that basically we as Americans have a fundamental right to know where a product came from before we purchase it. We may want to support a particular country or we may not want to support a particular country. And if it's not marked at all, then we can go under the assumption that this is a product of America. But anyhow, it does work into the role for, for our purposes and for U.S. Customs. You know, one, one, one example that comes to mind, and if you recall, um, very early on, I had mentioned something like, uh, we got a guy here in um, um, France and there's a guy here in Germany, and the guy in Germany bought something uh, from uh, the guy in France, and then later on, the guy in Germany sold it to somebody in the USA. And now you're sitting here as a broker, and everything you know about this shipment screams Germany. Uh, the invoice is in German, uh, country of export is German, and everything else, but yet when we go to compute the duty, again, duty is based on uh, uh, country of origin, we're going to have to calculate duty on a product from France. So how do we know? Well, one of the tools that's available for us is we could actually go out and look at the cargo itself because it should be marked with the country of origin. But there's a variety of reasons uh, besides that why the product is going to be, needs to be marked with the country of origin. So again, uh, country of origin, we said earlier, is where the product was made, mined, grown, manufactured, or underwent substantial transformation, just for a quick reminder. All right, and what, what we'll do is what I'd like to begin with is to talk about uh, the requirements of the product itself. Um, what are the requirements when they mark it? So we'll just call this requirements. And don't forget, if you have not already done so, in, in the corner of your notes or something, write down part 134 and do that on every page. Okay, so the basic re requirements uh, for marking are as such. It must be permanent. Okay, what's considered permanent? Well, you know, it, it's like this. If I have a machine and they, they take a big stamp and they, they stamp into the side of the machine made in Korea, obviously that's permanent. What about if I take a metal plate and I take a metal plate and I write made in Korea and I rivet that plate to the metal? Yeah, that's permanent, but some people will go, well, you know, the importer could take a screwdriver after it gets here and, and pry that off. That's okay, what you're gonna find out is as we go along, the intent is for the ultimate consumer, the ultimate purchaser, as long as he's the guy that understands and knows the country of origin when he buys it. So it has to be permanent, so it has to reach the ultimate consumer. Uh, it must be legible, not like my handwriting sometimes. It's, it's got to be legible, meaning that it can't be too faint, it can't be too small, it can't be blurred, and it must have contrast. And by contrast, what they mean is, if for example, if I were to import in this white board and with white lettering I said made in China, that wouldn't cut it. You can't have white on white or black on black. You need, you need to have some kind of contrast. The other requirement is that it must be conspicuous. Conspicuous, meaning that you should be able to see the country of origin in the course of normal handling of that product. 
In other words, imagine you're at, at the Walmart or whatever and, and, and you're reaching off of a shelf to buy a product. You should readily be able to see the country of origin of that product if it's imported. Or in other words, if you have a, a large widescreen TV, you're, you're not going to push it on its side and look underneath the bottom of the stand and see a little sign that says, you know, made in Japan or something like that. The, uh, some other requirements are that it must be in English. The country of origin requirement must be in English, except, and there are a lot of exceptions you'll find as we go along in the course, and they like to test on the exceptions, except NAFTA. If it comes from a NAFTA country, and we haven't discussed NAFTA yet, but I'm sure you probably got a good idea that NAFTA is a, a, a trade agreement between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. If the product originates from a, a NAFTA country, i.e. Canada or Mexico, then French and Spanish is okay. French and Spanish is okay, providing it came from a NAFTA country. Let me ask you this. Is this okay? Made in Rome. And that's my country of origin marketing requirement. Is that acceptable? And the answer is no. Uh, it must state country, not city. In other words, it has to say made in Italy, not, not made in Rome. Speaking of made in, are the words made in required? In other words, uh, can I just do the word Singapore? Is that okay? And the answer is yes. Made in is not required unless, except, another except, made in, the words made in are only required is only required if it is next to a U.S. locality. I'll explain that in a minute. Just write it down. A U.S. locality or a trade name. Meaning this. If the article that you're importing in has any kind of a U.S. locality, for example, if I import shirts in from China and the shirt says Big Apple, New York. New York is a U.S. locality, therefore now the words made in are required. And if I import um, a hat and the hat says Ferrari or something like that, then also made in is required. Train names we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Uh, we, we group it all together on what's called intellectual property rights. And we'll talk about trademarks, patents, and copyrights, all that business a little bit later on. But basically, uh, I cannot build a computer tomorrow and start selling it on the market and calling it IBM or Gateway, right? Because somebody else owns that name. A trade name is a name in which somebody actually owns. Uh, so it, a U.S. locality, it could be a state or a city, and any kind of a, a trade name, the words made in are required. However, oh, how about this? Can I abbreviate? Can I use abbreviations? And they do ask about this on the exam. Can I abbreviate the country of origin? And the answer is yes, but it's a limited yes. For ex there are certain uh, exemptions. For example, I can do UK for United Kingdom, and also I can have a variety of spelling in very limited use. In fact, they, uh, they are outlined in your regulations, and I'm looking for it. 134.45. 134.45. Make, write that down in your notes. And uh, if you look there, it'll give you a list of a few approved abbreviations and uh, variations of spelling. For example, instead of Italy, they, ex they accept Italia and Brazil with either an S or a Z and just a couple. But just know that any, uh, all the approved abbreviations and, and variations of spelling are in 134.45, okay? Let me ask you this. How do we handle, well, when I, let's do that. I just told you that every article imported into the customs territory of the United States is re required to have the country of origin marking on it. And as soon as I tell you that, now I'm going to tell you except. And it's important that you know the exemptions. Certain things are exempt from marking, to, from CO marking. And again, uh, I'll just abbreviate country of origin as, uh, as CO, okay? Um, first of all, American goods returned. 
And also, I'm going to abbreviate that just as AGR. American goods return. Obviously, if I take an American product and I ship it overseas and it comes back, for any reason, the guy rejects it, it didn't work, um, he's sending it back to have it repaired or whatever, customs is not going to stop it at the border here in the United States and go, hey, you know, you didn't pass country of origin marketing requirements. Uh, another exemption are products from our insular possessions. And we'll talk about insular possessions later on uh, in the course when we talk about the harmonized tariff. But that would be like the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, Midway, Samoa. Uh, they're not part of the United States Customs Territory, but they do enjoy a lot of the same benefits as though they are uh, part of uh, the U.S. Uh, <laughs> of part of the U.S. Customs Territory. Forgive me. Uh, transportation, transportation entries. And I'll explain that in a minute. If you recall, uh, basically we said there are only like three types of entries in the beginning. Uh, there are consumption entries when something's coming into the United States to be consumed into our economy. We had warehouse entries where um, uh, the importer may not be sure what he wants with that product yet, and he can kind of put it in a warehouse. And we'll talk about all those entries later in the course. And also had made mention about a transportation entry. So if this is the United States, and I, and I think I mentioned to you there might be a guy in Europe with freight going to Japan instead of going around the Panama Canal. He's just bringing it into New York, and he's going to truck it right across New York. And as soon as it gets to, let's say, Seattle or San Francisco or something, then he's going to put it on another boat. So the merchandise is just passing through. Or for that matter, you know, we could have a, a Mexican freight going to Canada. And the only reason it's coming to the United States is just to pass on through. It's a transportation entry. We're going to do a transportation entry because we have to account for that movement somehow in the U.S. We just can't let stuff come in. At any rate, if something's coming in on a transportation entry, it is exempted from the marking requirement, which makes sense because we don't really care about whether it's marked properly or not because it's not going to enter our our commerce or our economy. And the other exemption from the marking requirement, and this is a very important note, please make sure you follow this, something called articles on what we call the J list. The J list. And J list gets its name because out of the Tariff Act of 1930, Section 304J, it lists a, a bunch of things that are exempted from marking because they, they are deemed incapable of being marked. And actually, it's in 134. 33 of the regulations, make a note of that and actually go to 134.33 and make a star on that page or paper clip it or something for the exam because invariably if there's going to be a question on the exam regarding country of origin, um, it, it's going to be an article that's on the J-list. So what are those things? You can look at the J-list. I want you to look at the J-list. But for now, it's the kind of things that, that might make sense. For example, fluids. How are you going to permanently, legibly, and conspicuously mark a fluid? You can't. Uh, rare oil paintings, right? And if you look at the list, um, I'll have a, a, a series of other things. Eggs, live animals, uh, gravestones, a tombstone. Can you imagine made in China on a tombstone? And it has to be legible, conspicuous, and permanent. Wouldn't work. So there are, are uh, know what that J list is. And, and there's an old exam question that comes up from time to time again. And, and make sure you're really familiar with that, J, with that J list, all those items. It's kind of a lousy question. It, it asks you whether or not theatrical effects are on the J list. And if you look at the J list, you won't see it unless you look under effects, comma, the, uh, theatrical. So just you know, make sure you're familiar with that list. Or if you do get a question on the J list, uh, please take your time and review it very carefully. OK, there are other items that are also exempted from marking requirements. I'll just keep adding this to your, your, um, your exemption list. Um, we, I mentioned fluids a minute ago. Um, if, if container is marked, if the container is marked, then it's OK. I don't have to mark the article. OK, and that would that'd be going back to our liquids. If I have a can of soda and the can is made in uh, Taiwan, but the soda is made in Canada, all we have to do is show Canada. The, con uh, the container will reflect uh, the country of origin of the product in which it contains. But it doesn't have to be just fluids. Any kind of container, again, the operative word is the ultimate consumer. If that, con if that product, when it's in its container, 
If that container reaches the ultimate consumer, then we've satisfied that requirement, and the article itself will not have to be marked. Uh, here's a pair of glasses, and you notice it'll say Taiwan, and I hope you can pick it up. Now, talk about a perfect country of origin marking. You notice the words made in are not included because they're not required. It's permanent. I can't ru rub it off. It's conspicuous uh, because I, I see it every time I pick up the glasses. And um, it it's legible, meaning that it has contrast. What could be better than black on white? Another thing that I just came across when I was, I, I was over at the local supply store, if you can see this, th this pin, uh, this is a real good example for two reasons. You notice that it says made in Germany. Now, what the significance are, uh, is that Mount Blanc happens to be a trade name. And because it's a trade name, the words made in are going to be required. And this is also an example where the container is marked with the country of origin, but not necessarily the product, as long as the container reaches the ultimate consumer. Two real good examples of country of origin marking. Both manufacturers did a good job. OK, look at this question. Not only is that a good question, it will show you how well Customs writes their, their questions. And it's really pretty an easy one. It says, I have bovine leather. That's what the question tells me. It says, you have bovine leather. They, they Customs exam, actually gives me my uh, tariff number. They say it's classified at 41 07-19-60-10. OK, so far, so good, no problem. They tell me the value of this merchandise is $25,000. What is my duty rate? Piece of cake. Uh, oh, my choices. Uh, A, 0. B, uh, 1250. C, 6,250, D, 10,000, and E, 11,250. So those are my choices. Boy, how easy can it get? Well, let's do this. If, and you can do the, you've got to trust me on this for now, and you can do this as soon as we stop the DVD. If you look this up, and you look up this harmonized tariff number, you'll see, you read across, it'll say 5%. OK? So 5% of 2,500, 5 times 5 is 25, carry the 2, 1,250. Wrong. The next to the duty rate, you'll see this. You'll see a check mark with an underline on it and a 1. And what that is, that's a footnote. It's a footnote like any other footnote. If you're reading a book, footnote tells you to go down and look at the bottom. It, they use the number one because it's the only footnote on this page. If someplace later on that harmonized tariff page, if they had another footnote, they would call it two. And you would go down and see what two means. So if you go down to uh, the footnote at the bottom of the page, it tells you to go to 9903. It sends you to 90, actually, um, 9903, I'll get to there in a minute. But So, OK, no problem. I'm going to go to 9903. And I, when I go to 9903, it, you read across, and it says the duty rate is 40%. OK? So 40% times 25,000 is 10,000. This is my answer. Wrong. If you go to the front of the chapter of 99, uh, just as you would in anything else in the harmonized tariff, you go to the front, um, it will tell you anything in chapter 99 is what you add to the existing duty rate. It's not saying it's a duty rate. You take this plus the original. So my proper duty rate would have been 45%, because I'm going to add this one and that one, bringing me to E, 11,250. Now, do you see how well this, uh, this, this question is written? It's written uh, hoping that you're going to make the wrong choice. And all the choices of my, uh, uh, all my possible choice, choices are logical in that even if I went uh, part of the way but not all the way. So just, just to give you an example, let's take a look at this right now. And I want to show you this in, in the harmonized tariff. So if we look, uh, here, here's the harmonized tariff. And if we look, there's 4107 19 000. 
5% duty, and there's that one uh, little check mark, and then uh, there's my footnote. I go to the footnote. It says 9903-4105, and then I go to 9103-4105. There's my uh, footnote, and it drives me to 40%. So just be aware of that and understand that anything in Chapter 99 is something that we add to the existing duty. Well, there you have it, and that's indicative of all 22 classes. We stand on very solid ground when we say that this is the most thorough, the most accurate, and the most affordable course in the country. Can we guarantee you'll pass? No, nobody can make a guarantee like that. But what we will guarantee are two things. One, if you take this course and you follow our instructions, you'll be more prepared than anybody else in that exam room. And two, a custom house broker license is something that will change your personal, your financial, and your professional status in life. Choosing the right program of study will make that a reality. Thank you.